Before I pray, let me just give two preliminary comments about Lewis books and, and this manuscript. There are some books by Lewis in the bookstore. There shouldn't be any when we shut this bookstore down. You, you won't go wrong in buying something from Lewis. So if, you're, if you see anything there you don't have by Lewis, you should buy it. And with regard to this manuscript that I'm going to be using, uh, David has had a chance to work on it this morning, so it will be on the internet when I'm done here. So I didn't want him to put it up now because you go there and look at it while I'm talking, and that would be intimidating to me. <laughs> but the best way to listen, I think, is, is probably not by taking notes since the, the manuscript will be there with all of its footnotes, but by thinking and praying and pondering and maybe jotting questions down for, for tomorrow's panel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your gift to us of C.S. Lewis. I want to be faithful first to you. Second, I want to be faithful to your word. Third, I want to be faithful to tell the truth about C.S. Lewis and not get him wrong. And I want to tell the story of his influence on me. And so would you take all of that attempt and make it really profitable for those who hear. So that their faith would be strong and their joy would go deep and their sense of your absolute truth would be unshaken. And they would be mightily influential for the glory of Christ in this world. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My approach is going to be personal. I'm going to talk about what Lewis has meant most to me, how he's helped me most. And as I raise that question, as I have many times over the years, as to why this man has been so powerful in my life, the backdrop of the question becomes increasingly urgent. Namely, why has he been so significant to me even though he's not reformed and would barely be called an evangelical by typical American uses of that word? He does not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. He defaults to logical arguments more naturally than to biblical exegesis. He doesn't treat the Reformation with respect, but thinks it could have been avoided and calls aspects of it farcical. He steadfastly refused in public and in letters to explain why he did not go to the Roman Catholic Church but remained in the Church of England. He makes room for at least some people to be saved through imperfect representations of Christ in other religions. He made a strong, logical, and I think unbiblical case for free will to explain the existence of suffering. He speaks of the atonement with respect, but puts little significance on any of the explanations of how the atonement actually saves sinners. In other words... Lewis is not a writer to which we should turn for growth in a careful biblical understanding of Christian doctrine. His value is not in biblical exegesis. Lewis is not the kind of writer who provides substance for pastor's sermons. If a pastor treats Lewis as a substance giver, his sermons will be be quickly exhausted of biblical content. So, why don't I put Lewis in the category, say, with liberal theologians and with the emergent writers? At at one level, the mistakes he makes are very similar to the mistakes that emergent writers make. But there was something about the way he read Scripture that made my own embrace of inerrancy tighter, not looser. 
There was something about the way he spoke about the grace of God and the power of God that made, that made me value the particularities of the Reformation more, not less. There's something about the way he portrayed the wonders of the Incarnation that makes me more suspicious of his inclusivism, not more accepting of it. There's something about the way he spoke about doctrine as the necessary roadmap that leads to reality and the way he esteemed truth and reason and precision of thought that made me cherish more, not less, the historical articulations of the biblical explanations of how the cross saves sinners, the so-called theories of the atonement. Lewis devoted his whole life to what he called mere Christianity, to defending and adorning the Christian religion, quote, as understood ubique et ab omnibus, as everywhere and by everyone believed. So he didn't want to write about any denomination or any branch. He wanted to talk about mere Christianity. Now there's a price to pay when you set yourself that kind of agenda. You will almost certainly omit things essential to the gospel. Not that you don't believe them. I think he was a Christian, a very profound, deeply true Christian. But virtually all important doctrines have been disputed from within the church. Not from without, but from within the church. And if you make it an effort to only deal with matters about which there is no dispute within the global church, you run the risk of omitting very important things. And we should have been warned about this because in the New Testament letters, the way Paul in particular articulates the truth and defends the truth of the gospel is not by arguing with people outside the church, but by arguing with people inside the church. All of the New Testament letters come clear to us through intra-church disputation. And therefore, if you try to set your agenda as a pastor to omit things that are not um, controverted, you will not preach at all. And so it was a highly dangerous agenda that he set himself. No pastor should follow him in this, namely to ordain, or adorn, and defend uh, the truths that all Christians everywhere have believed. He was a professor of English literature from 1924 to 1963 at first Oxford, then Cambridge. He was not a pastor. He didn't have to open the scriptures week in and week out and feed the same flock for 30 or 40 years and explain to them the meaning of the Bible and give them the riches of the whole counsel of God. He had the luxury, so to speak, of picking and choosing the things about which he would talk in public about the Christian faith. And he wrote books on science fiction, um, children's books, poetry, essays, apologetics, and in them all he chose to focus on mere Christianity. And within that focus, that limited focus, which he would say is infinitely large, he fell short of saying many important things regarding the gospel of Christ. However, if I focus on what he said instead of what he didn't say, even for me, who consider some of the doctrines absolutely crucial that he passed over, I find that the blessings of C.S. Lewis in my life are incalculable. And so you can see the problem that, that I've, I'm facing 
as I take this up. Having said all of those misgivings about the way he approached doctrine and the Bible, I find myself in massive debt to him. And so I speak out of that struggle to make plain to you how those two things can be. How can it be that one whose errors seem so blatant to me be so significant in my life? That's the question I'm posing myself. What, what was it that helped me so much? And I'll, I'll tell you in a sentence what it was, and then we'll spend an hour unpacking it. I think the answer lies in the way that Lewis brought the experience of joy, it's a technical term for him that we'll get at, the experience of joy together with a defense of absolute objective truth that puts him in another world from the emergent writers, the world where I love to be. It is a world I feel totally at home in when he talks about it. Um, the way Lewis deals with these two things, joy and truth, joy and truth, is so radically different from liberal theology or from the postmodern slipperiness of emergent writers that he is in another universe and I have found myself in that universe with him for 30 years or so, 40 years or so, uh, awakened over and over again, made more alive, more perceptive, more responsive, more earnest, more hopeful, more amazed, more passionate for the glory of God every time I turn to see S. Lewis. It's this combination of experiencing the stab of God's shaped joy and defending objective absolute truth because of the absolute reality of God that sets Lewis apart as unparalleled in the modern world as far as I can see. To my knowledge, there is no one else who puts these two things together the way Lewis does. So... Let me unpack for you then what I mean by his experience of joy and his defense of absolute, objective, ultimate truth and how these two relate to each other in the way that is so explosive for me. First, Lewis's experience of joy. Uh, Lewis wrote an autobiography that covers the first 30 years of his life called Surprised by Joy. He wrote it 20 years after that, and so it bears the marks of his ripe assessment of what God was doing in his first 30 years. He tells of three instances as a child when there was awakened in him something that he has now chosen at a distance of about 50 years to call joy with a capital J. This term in Lewis is not synonymous with pleasure or happiness, according to him. The experience of this joy is the most important theme of his life. So, in other words, in my telling you about what has been personally most powerful for me, I'm not picking something marginal. By Lewis's own testimony, by Clyde Kilby's testimony, by Alan Jacobs' testimony, what I'm talking to you about right now was the central issue for his life and, and heart. He said this of the experience of joy, quote, in a sense, the central story of my life is about nothing else, close quote. Here's the closest thing he gives to a definition of joy. It is the experience, quote, of an unsatisfied desire, which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. Close quote. 
This is why he chose to call it joy and not desire or longing or the German Sehnsucht when writing his autobiography because those words do not convey the desirability of the longing itself. The desirability of the unsatisfied nature of the desire. Quote, I call it joy, which is here a technical term and must be sharply distinguished both from happiness and from pleasure. Joy, in my sense, has indeed one characteristic and one only in common with them. The fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. Apart from that, and considered only in its quality, it might almost equally be called a particular kind of unhappiness or grief. But then it is the kind we want. I doubt whether anyone who has tasted it would ever, if both were in his power, exchange it for all the pleasures in the world. But then joy is never in our power and pleasure often is. Alan Jacobs is right. That's the biography that I read in getting ready for this, other biography I read ages ago, and I recommend it highly, the Narnian, it's called, Ellen Jacobs' biography, is right to say nothing was closer to the core of his being than this experience. And perhaps what sealed its significance for Lewis is that it brought him to Christ. He was an atheist in his 20s, but relentlessly God was pursuing him through the experience of what he called sometimes joy and sometimes an inconsolable longing that he loved to experience and had no control over. And he was increasingly finding in his literary studies that it was the Christian writers from centuries ago where it happened most often. One decisive influence as he was coming to the Lord was J.R.R. Tolkien, the writer of The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Tolkien argued, and Lewis picked up the argument and repeated it over and over again the rest of his life, when this joy... Tolkien was trying to explain to this atheist, when this joy, this stab of inconsolable longing is awakened by certain powerful myths or stories, it is evidence that behind these myths, there is a true myth with a capital M. There's a true story with a capital S that really exists. And the reason for the joy that it's desirable, it's because it's real. And the reason it's inconsolable is because where you're getting it isn't the true one. The true myth and the real joy is the original shout, so to speak. And the stories and the myths that you're reading every day in your career are echoes. Tolkien pressed. And Lewis later use this analogy of what was moving in him. A man's physical hunger does not prove that that man will get any bread. He may die of starvation on a raft in the Atlantic. But surely, a man's hunger does prove that he comes from a race which repairs its body by eating and inhabits a world where eatable substances exist. Or, to put it another way, quote, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. 
God overcame his atheism in the spring term of 1929. He was 30 years old. Who, this is Lewis, who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking and struggling, resentful, darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape. Now that was not the end of the struggle because he wasn't a Christian yet. He just became a theist in the spring term of 1929. Gave up protesting against the divine being as the source of the inconsolable longing. He didn't know Christ yet. He wasn't submitted to Jesus. October 1st, 1931, two years later, he wrote a letter to Arthur Greaves, his friend. I have just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ, in Christianity. Lewis now began to look back on these 30 plus years and all of his experiences of joy and his reading and in the stories and in the myths and in the attic of his old childhood home and in the walks in the woods, wherever it would be stabbing him. He began to look back and and now things began to look different. It was still inconsolable. It was still pleasant. But now it was a desire for God. And it was evidence that he was made for God. Quote, the books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found. The echo of the tune we have not heard. The news from a country we have never yet visited. All Lewis life, he said, quote, an unattainable ecstasy has hovered just above the grasp of my consciousness. The sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to find the place where all the beauty comes from. But when he was born again, to see the glory of God in Christ, he never said that again, ever. Now he knew where it all came from. He knew where the joy was pointing. On the last page of his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, I recommend it, at least if you're a literary type. On the last page of his autobiography, he explained the difference between the joy now and the joy then. While that other, that other was in doubt, when he didn't know what it was all pointing to, while it was in doubt, the pointer naturally loomed large in my thoughts. When we are lost in the woods, the sight of a signpost is is a great matter. He who first sees it cries, look, the whole party gathers around and stares at the sign. But when we have found the road and are passing signposts every few miles, we shall not stop and stare. They will encourage us, and we shall be grateful to the authority that set them up, but we shall not stop and stare, or not much. (laughs) I love it. Not on this road, though their pillars are of silver and their lettering of gold, we would be at Jerusalem. So Lewis stopped turning joy into an idol when he found by grace that it was a pointer to something other, namely to God. 
Now, we make a turn. How did this experience of joy relate to Lewis's defense of objective, absolute truth? How did the two come together? The first thing he taught, by the way, at Oxford was philosophy. He did his first BA in philosophy. Then he did his second BA in literature. Just taught philosophy for a year, shifted over, and his imagination awoke. He almost died as a philosopher. Intellectually, mentally, imagination. But he never lost the tools of philosophy. The tools of God. What we see is that when Lewis saw the historical Christ and the eternal, objective, absolute, real God as the object of his consolable longing, he knew, intuitively, and then with reason, he knew if truth goes, if objective reality goes, if the possibility of knowing goes, joy goes. Because joy had taken him to the real. It had taken him to objective, absolute source. The original shout, it's there. All this was echo. If If that goes, this is infinitely trivialized. Christ was real. God was real. Truth was real. Here's the way he put the connection. There was no doubt that joy was a desire. But a desire is turned not to itself, but to its object. The form of the desired is in the desire. It is the object which makes the desire harsh or sweet, coarse or choice, high or low. It is the object that makes the desire itself desirable or hateful. I have been wrong in supposing that I desired joy itself. Joy itself, considered simply as an event in my own mind, turned out to be of no value at all. All the value lay in that of which joy was the desiring. And that object, quite clearly, was no state of my own mind or body at all. Now here you see the absolutely crucial link for him between truth and joy. Quote, joy itself, considered simply as an event in my own mind, turned out to be of no value at all. All the value laid in that of which joy was the desiring. So you see what is at stake for Lewis in the question of truth. The entire modern world, as he saw it, was moving away from what he was discovering. Namely, that objective, absolute, external, outside of me, reality slash truth with a capital T, exists. And everything hangs on it that's worth living for. And now we live, what, 40 years later, he died the same day as John Kennedy. And we live in a sea of postmodern relativism that he could smell and hate it with all his might. He wrote what Alan Jacobs calls his most significant critique of culture a little book called The Abolition of Man. Significant title. He takes on a high school textbook. It might be a junior high, it doesn't say. A secondary school textbook. In an imaginary way, but he said, I have these books on my shelf. I'm not making this up. In it, he illustrates what he means by the abolition of man and by his defense of truth with this interchange. He's quoting now the authors of this horrible textbook as he assesses it that our children are reading. 
Quote, when the man said, this is not Lewis talking, this is the author of the textbook. When the man said, that is sublime, he was talking about a waterfall, that is sublime, he appeared to be making a remark about the waterfall. Actually, he was not making a remark about the waterfall, but a remark about his own feelings. What he was saying was, really, I have feelings that I associate in my mind with the word sublime. Or shortly, I have sublime feelings. This confusion is continually present in language as we use it. We appear to be saying something very important about something real. And actually, we are only saying something about our own feelings. End quote from The Abolition of Man. Lewis says, the schoolboy who reads this text will believe two propositions. Firstly, that all sentences containing a predicate of value are statements about the emotional state of the speaker. And two, all such statements are unimportant. That, Lewis says, is the abolition of man. And it's the abolition of man, and it is. He's right. It's the abolition of man in more senses than one. Not only will everything true and beautiful and great be trivialized, just a snip, synapses going off in your brain, that's all it is. When you say you're a beautiful wife, or you're a faithful son, or this is a magnificent day, or God is faithful, or God is holy. They're just comments about what's going on in here. And everything is absolutely trivialized, and man, for all that man is worth, is destroyed by this epistemology. And so many of you are infected with it. Secondly, There's no resistance to tyrants anymore. Might makes right. If he says he's the best for the country and he'll use force to prove it, what have you got to say except to add your synapses to his synapses? And so much for that debate. Everything is trivialized. And in the end, Lewis says civilization is over. It will be over. So the abolition of man was his powerful defense of absolute truth. In the end, it wasn't so much for Lewis, I think, emotionally and immediately that civilization is being undone and that all is being trivialized, but that my discovery of joy is over. Joy is over. This universal, powerful, massive experience of an inconsolable longing pointing to something real out there, namely God, is nothing if truth is not real, if God is not real, if there's no objective reality outside of me. So Lewis' fight for truth was a fight for joy. We could take a long time here and ask the question that Sam has been asking about how that relates to the glory of God. And since he gave all those quotes that he got first dibs on, I will pass over them except to underline one sentence that was on the screen this morning. Here it is. This is is C.S. Lewis, not Jonathan Edwards. The Scotch Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Quote, fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify, God is inviting us to enjoy Him, close quote. I don't think 
Lewis ever read Jonathan Edwards. If he had, he would not have liked him. And the reason I say that is because he said that George MacDonald was the teacher he considered most close to the spirit of Jesus and had not written a page where he fancied MacDonald had not influenced him. And I know that MacDonald abominates Jonathan Edwards. This is not easy for me. To have two, the two dead people that have influenced me most outside the Bible, C.S. Lewis and Jonathan Edwards, would not have liked each other. In fact, might have despised each other. This is not easy. But so it is. The means by which God brought Lewis to himself, namely, the inconsolable longing that was delightful to have, called joy, turns out, in view of that quote Sam had on the screen, turns out to be the goal of his Christian life, namely the glory of God. Because by delighting in God, God is is glorified. Now, why, in summary, am I still so helped by Lewis when he has made so many mistakes? And my answer is that nobody that I know of put the experience of joy profoundly analyzed together with a defense of absolute, objective, outside of me, ultimate truth together like Lewis. Nobody combines the implications of this experience of joy throughout his life with the implications of this razor-sharp, logical, philosophical side of Lewis. Nobody that I've ever read comes close. So what I want to do in the remainder of our time is to give you six or seven practical implications of this combination that have walloped me, shaped me, made me. I met Lewis as a freshman in college in mere Christianity and then began to read. I've read almost everything he's written outside the the book he called the O'Hell book um, because that's the initials Oxford History of English Language, O-H-E-L. I've never read that one, although I've got a quote from it here because it's so good. But I've read more of Lewis than any biography I've given in the last 22 years, with the possible exception of Edwards. So he's been with me a long time, and I do not cease to be helped. Why? So I've given you the core why, experience of joy, profoundly analyzed And the experience of defending truth, absolute, objective, outside of me, meeting together in a way I I don't know any other author does. Now, that coming together creates these six or seven things. Number one, Lewis' pursuit of joy by means of rational defenses of the truth had a liberating effect on me from false dichotomies. He demonstrated for me and convinced me that rigorous, precise, penetrating logic is not inimical to deep, soul-stirring feeling, vivid, lively imagination. He was a romantic rationalist. That's one of the little books I read 40 years ago. I couldn't find it in print anywhere. It's this little paperback called... Lewis, romantic rationalist. He combined what almost everybody today assumes are mutually exclusive. Rationalism and poetry. Cool logic, warm feelings. Disciplined prose, free imagination. And in shattering these old stereotypes for me, he freed me to think hard and write poetry argue for the resurrection and compose a hymn to Christ, smash an argument and hug a friend, demand a definition and use a metaphor. 
It's a wonderful thing when a great man shows a struggler how to be himself. Number two. Liberation from chronological snobbery. Lewis' unwavering commitment to what is true and real and valuable as opposed to what is trendy and fashionable and current has been another kind of liberation for me for which I will thank God to the end of my days. He loved the wisdom of the ages. He lived outside his century. He didn't care about the whimsy of passing present. He called himself in his first inaugural lecture at Cambridge. After 30 years at Oxford, went to Cambridge, and his first lecture, he called himself a Neanderthaler and a dinosaur. And he said, if you can't be persuaded by me as an arguer, consider me a specimen (laughs) from the Middle Ages. And he was. He was a... He was. I I wish his tribe had not died out. I wish the dinosaurs had not become extinct. I I hope they live again. He didn't read newspapers. He never wore a watch. He never learned to type. Never owned a car or drove one except once. Cared nothing about good appearances. He wore the same old clothes till they were threadbare. He was incredibly free from the addicting powers of the present moment. And the effect on me was just huge. It made me wary of what he called chronological snobbery. Something is Good, because it's new. There is no correlation between newness and goodness. Duh. There's just no correlation between oldness and goodness or newness and goodness. It's irrelevant to when something is good and beautiful and true and valuable. Time has nothing to do with it. Truth and beauty and goodness are not determined by when they exist. Nothing is inferior for being old. Nothing is valuable for being new. This has freed me from the tyranny of novelty and opened for me the wisdom of the centuries. And I thank God for C.S. Lewis. Number three. Lewis' keen, penetrating sense of his own heart's ache for joy, combined with his utter amazement at the sheer objective realness of things other than himself, has over and over awakened me from the slumbers of self-absorption to see and to savor the world and the maker of the world. And this has slopped over onto doctrine and the gospel. When I read Lewis' experience of the world and how awake he is to reality that I just ignore and I'm awakened again to see the world the way he sees it, I see Christ more clearly. I read my Bible with new eyes. This is what I thank him for. Lewis gave me and continues to give me an intense sense of the astonishing realness of things. He had the ability to see and to feel what most of us see and don't see. He had what Alan Jacobs called omnivorous attentiveness. I love that phrase. Omnivorous attentiveness. Oh, just take that away and, and, and pay double for your conference registration. Just, I, just, I just gave that to you. No added expense at all. Change your life. Omnivorous attentiveness. I hope you feel what I'm talking about. I love that phrase. 
What this has done for me is hard to communicate. To wake up in the morning and be aware of the firmness of the mattress, the warmth of the sun's rays, the sound of the clock ticking or my wife's breathing machine, the coldness of the wooden floor, the wetness of the water in the sink, the sheer being of things, what Lewis called quiddity, Latin for whatness, W-H-A-T-N-E-S-S, the whatness of reality. It's just there. I mean, there didn't have to be water. Imagine a world in which there's no water, and one day somebody says, I guess I want to show you. Look, you would just, you would fall down. You would, you would that's amazing. But you, you never say that. Lewis does. He, 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 he gets me going in such a way that when I walk to the 6.30 prayer meeting, across the bridge, I have the little child feeling as the sun's coming up, he did it again. <laughs> they got that from Chesterton. You should say that every morning. He did it again. The sun came up. Look at that. That's 93 million miles away. Holding us in place. Making us perfectly warm. Even here. This is okay. <laughs> We're not dead. <laughs> he helped me to become alive to life. To look at the sunrise. He helped me to see what is there in the world. Things that if we didn't have them, we would pay a million dollars to get them and having them ignore. Your eyes, your fingers. He convicts me of my callous inability to enjoy God's daily gifts. He helps me to awaken my dazed soul so that the realities of life and of God and of heaven and of hell are seen and felt. I could go on and on about how this affects preaching, brothers. How this affects communication. How seeing suns and water and fingers and cold wooden floors affects the way you preach. And the living power of words. Because you've seen and felt and you bring that over onto the Bible. Pow! Suddenly reality streaming out of these pages. Because by grace, Lewis or whoever has waked you up. From the slumbers of self-absorption. Number four. The perils of introspection. Lewis' experience of the pursuit of joy. And the mistakes he made. Has had a huge effect on the way I think about the assurance of salvation. How do you counsel people who come to you, as they do to me almost every week, with questions about the assurance? How can I know I'm real? You preach in such a way that I almost feel like I'm not a Christian every week. So help me. And and I, I spend huge amounts of time. I wrote a whole book about that when I don't desire God, trying to help people with that issue. Well, Lewis has helped me amazingly with this. This is very profound. I hope you get it in the next four or five minutes. What he discovered is that the effort to know the experience of joy by looking at the experience of joy is self-defeating. He wrote this. I saw that all my waitings and watchings for joy 
all my vain hopes to find some mental content on which I could, so to speak, hang my finger and say, lay my finger and say, this is it, had been futile attempt to contemplate the enjoyed. It can't be done. For the moment we step outside ourselves to contemplate our enjoying, we are no longer enjoying. And there's nothing to see. Not quite nothing, he says. A sediment it remains. And the sediment is a physical sensation. You see it and then doubt the reality of your joy and the assurance of salvation fails as you try to get outside yourself look inside to see if the thing you were doing before you stepped outside is real it's not there anymore it will never work people are doing this all the time and feeling horribly discouraged wondering I can't ever find anything real inside of me. You've been there. I've been there. Let me read it again. This is Lewis. This is our dilemma. As thinkers, we are cut off from what we think about. As tasting and touching and willing and loving and hating, we do not clearly understand. The more lucidly we think, the more we are cut off. The more deeply we enter into the reality, the less we can think. You cannot study pleasure in the moment of nuptial embrace, nor repentance while repenting, nor analyze the nature of humor while roaring with laughter. But when else can we know these things? You cannot hope and also think about hoping at the same time. For in hope, we look to hope's object. And we interrupt this by, so to speak, turning around and looking in hope. That is huge. What this has meant is first that I now see that the pursuit of joy must always be indirect. Focusing not on the experience of joy, but on the object enjoyed. In the moment that I turn around to examine my experience, to see if it's spiritual or to see if it's real, I cease to do what I'm trying to examine and therefore can't see it and therefore doubt and assurance goes now apply that to faith in Jesus the most authentic faith in Jesus is suspended when we begin to analyze our faith in Jesus our own Which means that this analysis always ends in discouragement. When we're trusting Christ most authentically, we're not thinking about trusting. We're thinking about Christ. We're loving Christ. We're delighting in Christ. We're contemplating Christ. When we step out of the moment to examine our trusting of Christ, we cease. And all we see is the sediment there of some psychological leftover, and it looks highly suspicious. So my counsel to strugglers week after week is relentlessly, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, and pray for eyes to see. When we're in our prayer room before preaching, before worship, weekend after weekend, you will hear prayers almost every time for self-forgetfulness. It's what we mean by authenticity in worship, preaching. When I'm preaching, I don't want to have a sweet sense that I'm preaching well. 
I want no prayer, no sense that I'm preaching. None. I don't want to know that I'm preaching. I don't want to think that I just did that. It's no good now. I'm all into myself right now, this very moment. I've just goofed it up with an illustration. You see what I'm saying? You don't, you just don't want any of that nice approval stuff. I don't want anything about Piper. I want totally there, in the text, in the reality, there. That's a gift. It rarely comes in a sustained way, but oh, when it comes later, you say, yes, it happened. It happened for a few minutes. And that's what heaven will be. Number five, the incompleteness of duty without delight. I don't know if you're going to go here tonight, Sam, but I get to jump on you this time if you do. Um, You've got to understand how good it is for me to sit here and listen to Sam talk. Because you, you obviously know we're saying the same thing, right? Because we both drunk at the same well, right? He drunk at Edwards, I drunk at Edwards. He drunk at Lewis, I drunk at Lewis. We have drunk from each other's books. This is just sweet. I've never been in anything like this before to have myself come back at me so beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) Lewis' analysis of joy impelled me deeper into the biblical reality of what it means to walk by the Spirit or to live worthy of the gospel. Until we are gripped with joyful impulses of the gospel, joyful inner impulses of the gospel of grace from the inside, until we're gripped by that, we're always thinking in terms of doing external duties with pressures from outside. So here's the list of stuff to do. God will be pleased if we do it. And now we're going to work up the willpower to do it. That's just the religion. That's religion. That's morality. Christian hedonism, C.S. Lewis at this point, is massively penetrating and insightful. Listen to these two quotes. One of them I, I had never seen before. Somebody mailed it to me. I should give them credit. David may be able to remember who sent it to me. I think it might be Tony Reineke. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tony, wherever you are, for sending me this oh hell quote. <laughs> This is not it. I'll tell you when I get there. A perfect man would never act from a sense of duty. He'd always want the right thing more than the wrong one. Duty is only a substitute for love of God or of other people. Like a crutch, which is a substitute for a leg. Most of us need the crutch at times... But of course, it's idiotic to use the crutch when our legs, our own loves and tastes and habits can do the journey on their own. A perfect man would never act from duty. Wow. Now, the pursuit of holiness, therefore, is transformed. My teaching on sanctification Some of you brothers, I was talking with one of you about this, come from traditions in which this, what I'm saying right now, is just totally, totally, utterly (laughs) unknown. Unknown. Everything is lists. Conformity to external pressures in the church. Dress a certain way, talk a certain way, do stuff. And, And he's saying, no good man acts that way. You say, well, wait a minute, we built a whole church around that. Now, here's the really profound thing. This next quote, this is the one from the Oxford History of English Literature. And it's about the Reformation, it's about Puritans, and it's about William Tyndale in particular. What was William Tyndale about? What were the Protestant reformers about? Listen to this. This is good. In reality, Tyndale is trying to express an obstinate fact which meets us long before we venture into the realm of theology. The fact that morality or duty, what he calls the law, never yet made a man happy in himself or dear to others. 
It is shocking, but it is undeniable. We do not wish either to be or to live among people who are clean or honest or kind as a matter of duty. We want to be and associate with people who like being clean and honest and kind. The mere suspicion that what seemed an act of spontaneous friendliness or generosity was really done as a duty subtly poisons it. In philosophical language, the ethical category is self-destructive. Morality is healthy only when it is trying to abolish itself. Christ is the end of the law. I added that. Back to Lewis. In theological language, no man can be saved by works. The whole purpose of the gospel for Tyndale is to deliver us from morality. Thus, paradoxically, the Puritan of modern imagination, the cold, gloomy heart doing as duty what happier and richer souls do without thinking of it, is precisely the enemy which historical Protestantism arose and smote. That's powerful. That's powerful. And I just want to keep smiting. That's what Christian hedonism is. It's the smite on morality. It's the smite on religion. It's the smite on externality and performance and stuff, laws and lists that don't come from in here, that have never tasted the joy that have never embraced the absolute rock-solid heart-enlivening truth. We're at war. That's what Christianity is in my judgment. Number six. I'm skipping number six. You can read it. Three, two pages worth. Um, story. We'll make two more, and we'll be done. Story is great, but not everything. Lewis has been helpful in celebrating the power of story, which is very fashionable today. And yet, Lewis did not overstate the value of story or its exclusive claims upon us to the exclusion of exposition and argument and doctrine. Alan Jacobs wrote, Philosophy had gotten Lewis to Mount Pisgah, from which, like Moses, he could look out across the promised land, but it would be literature, it would be story that would take him into the land so that he could taste the milk and honey. That's true. And Lewis never drew the implication from that, that the tools of philosophy, of thought, of reason, of exposition, of excursus thinking, of doctrine should be neglected. He wrote three science fiction novels. He published many poems. He wrote seven world-class imaginary tales for children. And there were razor-sharp logical defenses of the Christian faith, like Problem of Pain, Miracles, The Abolition of Man, Christian Reflections, and dozens of essays. I love this. Owen Barfield, you know, he was surrounded by these group, this group called the Inklings. They, most of them thought he was crazy in doing what he did, uh, in, in writing defenses of the Christian faith at the popular level from a philosophical standpoint. They just thought, you're wasting your time. Write more stories. Write more novels. It's story. It's story that counts. Barfield said, you've got an expository demon. And it needs to be exercised. I thank God that Lewis never permitted his expository demon to be exorcised. I think he got it just about right. Handful of children's books, handful of science fiction novels, 
handful of poems, handful of razor sharp logical defenses of Jesus. That's pretty good. You take, you take this, you take the expository demon out of C.S. Lewis, everything fails. He could not have written what he wrote without this demon. You understand how I'm using the word demon. Just the opposite. I am deeply thankful that he would not be pressed into what many today are experiencing as a lopsided, unbiblical view of story. Story is precious and powerful. And the Bible has plenty of it. But explanation, exposition, doctrine are crucial to life, 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 poetry, marriage, children. You try to strip away logic, reason, thinking, exposition, linear argument from your life and replace it only with story, this will be one great cloud of unknowing. Both of them in Lewis are deepened and enriched by the other, and I thank God for it. Finally, number seven, um, Lewis' conception of our final eternal joy in the presence of God and what an unspeakable wonder that will be, final joy, and what a wonder that will be, enables him to stand in God-exalting awe of what it means to be human. He has helped me rise above my petty complaints about people and see people, at least from time to time, that's a confession, at least from time to time, as the staggering wonder that they are in the image of God. I love this quote. This is way up near the top of my favorites. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to today may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in your nightmares. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other on to one of these destinations. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. The effect that sort of seeing and thinking and speaking has had on me is to make me take life really seriously. Really seriously. Every human being, really, really, really seriously. Immortal horrors or everlasting wonders standing in front of me, in the city, at church, in the store, Don't get it wrong. To take life seriously doesn't mean to become morose. I hope not. Quote, we must play, but our merriment must be of that kind, and it is in fact the merriest kind which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. So in conclusion, life is serious. Even when we play. And the pursuit of joy is a serious matter. 
All of it is serious and happy because God is real. Neither he nor my experience of him as joy is a mere event in my own mind. There is God. There is objective truth. There is the gospel. And there is joy. And that God-glorifying joy is the great end of life. In it, God's glory and human joy meet without conflict. So perhaps it won't be surprising to you when uh, Lewis, who was awed by Christ as the incarnate God, dying for sinners and rising again, the, the true myth, perhaps it won't be surprising to you if I close with two quotes that go like this. The salvation of a single soul is more important than the production or preservation of all the epics and all the tragedies in the world. The glory of God and as our only means of glorifying Him, the salvation of human souls is the real business of life. I sent David last night one last long footnote and it was a response of Lewis to Norman Pittenger in the 1950s a liberal theologian in America who wrote in the book I mean in the, uh, the magazine Christian Century a critique of Lewis's oversimplified treatment of the Trinity in a popular work And just to give you a flavor of this man's heart, I'm going to read you, read you that footnote and then I'll pray. When I began, no, let me start one sentence earlier. Most of my books are evangelistic, addressed to those outside. When I began, Christianity came before the great mass of my unbelieving fellow countrymen either in the highly emotional form offered by revivalists or in the unintelligible language of highly cultured clergymen. Most men were reached by neither. My task was therefore simply that of a translator, one turning Christian doctrine, or what I hope to be such, into vernacular, into language that unscholarly people would attend to and could understand. Dr. Pittenger would be more helpful, critic, if he advised a cure as well as asserting many diseases. How does he himself do such work? What methods and with what success does he employ when he's trying to convert the great mass of storekeepers, lawyers, realtors, morticians, policemen, and artisans who surround him in his own city? Let's pray. So, Father, Lewis saw himself mainly in his popular writing as an evangelist. There was much more to him, but not less. And he considered to be this, this to be the, the real business of his life. We are pastors. How much more so? We want all these good effects of Lewis. We want none of the bad effects that he could have. And so I'm asking that these brothers would have discernment. And whether it's Lewis or another writer or their wives or somebody in their church or a dad or a mom or a friend, would you bring into their lives someone who would be used by the Holy Spirit to stab them broad awake to the truth with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.